started and then we'll begin. All right, so I know we didn't really get into 2 Samuel 1. We are today. So if you would, make your way in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 1. Again, this is, the, this is picking up exactly or immediately right after what has happened in chapter 31 with the death of Saul. And as we mentioned last week, the big focus in this chapter is the comparison about how does the messenger handle the news of Saul's death compared to David. That's really the, the big theme in this chapter, their, their difference. Uh, and it goes to show why David, again, uh, was a man who was innocent in, the, innocent in the death of Saul. Right, so we pick up in verse 1. Uh, here we, we are basically given a time stamp about when uh, the events of chapter 1 happened. Right, now it came to pass after the death of Saul when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites that David had abode two days in Ziklag, right? So there's no introduction here to the book. You know, we're not introduced to a new character like we were in 1 Samuel with Elkanah. We're not, uh, you know, we're not given sort of a, a, a background to this book. And that's how we know that this is a continuation of 1 Samuel chapter 1. Now, we're given, again, the exact time when... This, uh, this event has taken place, right? We know in verse 1, again, that when David returns, uh, when David returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, we know where he returned, right? Verse 1 is very clear about that, Ziklag. We know back in 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 26 that David, after he defeated the Amalekites, came back to the city of Ziklag. Now you note here, basically, the time frame is that the day of Saul's death, David uh, was in Ziklag. When David arrived in Ziklag is when the events of chapter 31 happened. And again, this is very important for us to know this because it proves to us that David was not with the Philistines at Mount Gilboa. He might have served in their army for a time. He might have served as a, a mercenary, we might could say, or, or a captain in the army for them. But we know that David is not at Mount Gilboa when these events take place. He's in Ziklag. And that's important for us to know. Just like with Nabal, we understand that David did nothing wrong to become the next king of Israel. David never took matters into his own hands, just like with Nabal. The Bible was clear with Nabal, right, that God struck him down. David didn't act out of revenge. We talked about that with Abigail. David did nothing wrong in that situation. And as we talked about last week, there comes a point in David's life where there are some that try to say that uh, Absalom's civil war against David was a result of David taking the throne from Saul through blood or, or through murder. But we know here that David was not at Mount Gilboa when, uh, when Saul died. We know that David, in many aspects of his life, allowed God to handle the matter rather than taking revenge in his own hands. And that's sort of the, you know, that, that's sort of the importance about why we have verse 1 and, and the, the clarification here. David was not there when Saul died. Now, the trip we, we see in verse 2 that came, to, came even to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. And so it was when he came to David that he fell to the earth and did ob, uh, obeisance. Now, the trip from Gilboa to Ziklag, we're told, is about 100 miles. Uh, we're told that generally for an average human being, it, uh, an average human being could walk 20 miles a day uh, at that time. Uh, and I don't know about y'all, but I think some of them were in a little bit better shape than I am. I don't know if I could walk 20 miles a day uh, over the period of several days. But we're told that, that generally the average person could walk about 20 miles. Uh, but we know that it was three days basically after the battle that he has arrived. So more than likely he's traveled on some type of animal to get down to where David is. Now we know, we'll see, we, we see what he's going to bring, the, the news that he's going to bring to David. Uh, and I will point this out. If you look in 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 10, 
David is recounting this event in chapter 1. Uh, and he's very clear about the purpose of the messenger. Right, 2 Samuel 4, verse 10. Obviously, Israel was defeated right at the end of chapter 31. But note, what, note how David characterizes this, or, or describes the speech of this messenger. 2 Samuel 4, verse 10. When one told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good tidings, and then we'll read about what happens there at the end. But the, the importance in that phrase is there in, in chapter 4, verse 10, thinking to have brought good tidings. And we'll note his description in a moment, or we, we see that in verse 2. But it is important for us to note that the purpose that this messenger had was that he thought he was bringing to David good news. Now, you know, sometimes you think about how much he would have traveled, obviously, a uh, hundred miles to cover that in three days would have meant that you wouldn't have stopped. You know, there there wasn't a, you know, there wasn't, you know, you, you obviously slept, but there wasn't a, a, a day in which you took several hours off to not travel. This is a man who's hurriedly gets down to figure out, gets down to where David's at. And in his mind, he's delivering to David good news, good tidings, as Second Samuel 4 verse 10 says. Now, you think about it for a moment, right? Uh, it, it's always kind of enjoyable to be the first person that delivers good news. You know, you think about whenever, uh, and I know most of you in here have experienced this, but whenever you're, uh, you learn that you're going to have a grandchild, right, and you can't wait to get to church and tell everybody you're going to have a grandchild or, or post it on Facebook or something like that, uh, you know, that it, it's enjoyable to be able to give good news, to be able to present good news, and perhaps that's what... Uh, at least in his mind, he's thinking about this. Now, obviously, his description is a little bit different here, but this is a man that has traveled a great distance in a short amount of time. It shows his urgency because he wants to present David this good news. But it doesn't look like that from his appearance, right? Verse 2, the man comes out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. Now, we know, of course, that to tear one's clothes was a sign of mourning. And, and I know Brother Wayne talked about this with Isaiah. Generally, whenever they tore their normal clothes, again, they put on sackcloth made out of goat's hair, very itchy, made one uncomfortable. Uh, but you note also he doesn't just do this, but you, you see that he also has earth upon his head or, or dirt upon his head. Generally, this was a, also an act to describe mourning, discomfort. The, the phrase itself sort of carries this idea that he put dirt on his head to make himself dirty. Uh, you know, it's more, it's more than just the idea that he comes in and he's got, you know, dirt in his hair or something like that. It's the idea that his appearance is very dirty. And, you know, generally we think about with the, with the tearing of the clothes and putting on sackcloth, it makes one uncomfortable. Well, to make oneself dirty, uh, to me, would also carry the same idea of feeling uncomfortable, right? I, I don't like, you know, I don't like being dirty, right? I, I like taking a shower and things like that. I like the, I like the feeling of, of being clean, and I think all of us in here like that. You know, that's one thing at camp I see with some of the, when we, whenever we're at Maywood, I see this sometimes with some of those younger campers. They'll go outside, and they'll get dirty all day, uh, but they don't take a shower at night, and they go to bed dirty, and I, I just can't do that. I don't know about you, but I can't go to bed if I've been outside working all day, I, I cannot go to bed feeling dirty. It just doesn't feel comfortable to me. But, uh, but I guess when I was younger, I, I didn't have a problem with that. But you, you get the idea. He, he's in mourning. You know, his clothes are, you know, he's, he's put on sackcloth, obviously. But he's also a very dirty individual. That was designed to, that was something that would make one extremely uncomfortable. Uh, just just as we are not comfortable with the idea of being dirty. It doesn't make us feel uh, good or clean or anything like that. Now you know too in the process of this, he goes and he falls down before David. And so it was when he came to David that he did fall to the earth and did obeisance to him. If you've got another translation, what do you have for that word obeisance? Or obeisance? Prostrate yeah, prostrate himself. For the idea... Uh, I know some translations, I think the ESV has paid homage or 
He goes and he bows down to David. And this is important because, as we'll see, by the time we get to verse 10, which we're, where we're going to try to end this morning, this messenger has recognized that David, or at least he recognizes that David's going to be the next king. And so, whereas David was a rival to Saul, this messenger recognized that, you know, David uh, was going to be the next king, so he, he paid him the respect of a king. And so you notice that he, he fell to the earth and did ob uh, obeisance, or he uh, fell prostrate and, and, and uh, you know, bowed himself down before David. Now look at this phrase, uh, fell to the earth, about how many times that exact phrase appears in the Bible. And believe it or not, there are three occasions in the Bible where the phrase fell to the earth occurs, in the King James Version at least. Three separate occasions where uh, fell to the earth, that, that exact phrase occurs. And in all three occasions, it's connected to somebody who's doing something wrong. And I found that very interesting. The first time we read about that phrase, at least that specific phrase, uh, at, least according, uh, at least according to the King James Version, first time you read about that phrase is in Joshua chapter 7. Uh, and think about it for a moment, uh, if you can. Uh, something bad had just happened to Israel. They had just lost to the, uh, they, they had lost a battle at the city of Ai. And Joshua fell down to the earth, or fell to the earth before God. You remember why he did that? Or what was the reason why the Israelites didn't win that battle? Yeah, that was, the, that was a situation in which Achan, right, had stolen from the tents when they were supposed to destroy everything. And even though Joshua didn't do something wrong, there was an individual who did wrong in that passage. Obviously here, you've got an instance where this man fell to the earth before David. Now we'll see that, and we, we see in this chapter that this man had uh, bad intentions despite his appearance. And then the third time where this phrase occurs is in Acts chapter 9, where Saul fell to the earth when he saw Jesus. And what was Saul doing in Acts chapter 9? Yeah, he's headed to persecute Christians. So that phrase, I, I, I don't know if there's any significance in it, but I, I, I find it interesting that specific phrase, fell to the earth, it occurs three times in the Bible. And in all three occasions, it's connected to somebody doing something wrong. Uh, and that further emphasizes, right, that this man, this messenger is not in the right. Uh, and so verses 3 through 5, here's David questioning or, or talking to the messenger. Right, so David said unto him, Where have you come from? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel I am escaped. And David said unto him, How did the matter go, I pray thee, tell me? And he answered that the people are fled from the earth, and many of the people also are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan his son are dead also. And David said to the young men that told him, How do you know that Saul and Jonathan his son uh, be or are dead? So this messenger, we don't know exactly what his name is, but we do have a couple of descriptive uh, phrases about him. You note in verse 5 that he is called a young man. Now generally we think about a young man, we think about, uh, we think about the idea of age. But sometimes in First and Second Samuel, the, the term young man actually referred to a man of war, or a man who was old enough to fight in war. Uh, and... This does not carry the idea that this is a 12-year-old kid or a 13, 14-year-old kid. I believe the age in which, and Dad, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the age in which an Israelite could fight in war was 18. So the young man here would have been someone who's at least 18 years old, right? And we know that today basically to be an adult. That's how we would think this. He's a young adult. But he's also a soldier of Israel. You note that he has come from the camp of Israel, verse 3. So we know that this is an Israelite, or at least uh, he was connected to the army of Israel. Uh, the, the word camp is, in this, in this context, it's not talking about uh, where a group of Israelites have camped out. It, it's talking about where the Israelite army has been stationed. You know, we might could say that this is sort of a, a military base. Israel's military base is where, where he has fled from. And we know in verse 8, we'll see that this is an Amalekite. 
Now we know, and you can get, Dad, you can go back to verse uh, 3 through 5. Or Yeah, that, that's fine. Uh, we know that when, when the uh, messenger talks about what he says to Saul, he tells him, he told Saul he was an Amalekite, but uh, David perhaps didn't need to ask that because, you know, David's very well acquainted with who the Amalekites are, what they look like. But the real, the real crux of the matter here is not necessarily the, the identity, but what happens, right? David, David asks again, where have you come from? He says, I, I, I've escaped out of the camp of Israel. So verse 4, David asks, how did it go? Well, it didn't go very great, right? Verse 4, uh, David probably recognized that when he said, I have escaped out of the camp of Israel, right? They, David probably recognized things didn't go well, but when he asked, in verse 4, how did the matter go? He's perhaps asking about how severe was the loss. Well, it's very severe. Verse 4, the messenger answered that the people are fled from the battle. Now, obviously, this signals a, a loss, right? A military loss. But to David, it would have signaled a whole lot more. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 26. And let's read verses 6 through 8. So Israel losing a battle, it had a lot more significance than just the fact that they lost they, that they had lost uh, that they had lost a battle. Right? So Leviticus chapter 26, let's look at verses 6 through 8. It's talking about when they come into the, uh, the land of Canaan. And I will give peace to the land, and ye shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land. And ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. And your enemies shall fall before you by the Lord. And then verse 9 for I will have respect unto you and make you fruitful and multiply you and establish my covenant with you. And in my Bible, there's a section there that labels this, this section from verses 3 through 13 in Leviticus 26, talking about the blessings of being obedient to God. And that's exactly what Moses is getting at here about what are the results of obedience to God. Well, one of it, one of those results, verses 7 and 8 specifically, is that Israel would be successful mili militarily or, or in, in battle. Again, verse 8, the, the emphasis being there, doesn't matter how many people you have to fight, if it's just five of you fighting against 100, if it's just 100 of you fighting against 10,000, it doesn't matter if you're obedient to God, you're always going to wind up being victorious. But now, in 2 Samuel chapter 1, Israel has not been victorious. And if Israel has not been victorious, what did that say about, in particular, Saul and his relationship with God? What's that? Not good. He hasn't been obedient, right? And we know back in chapter 28, the reason why Israel loses this battle is because Saul has been disobedient. So, you know, David recognizes this is not just a military defeat, but he also knows that God's not happy right now. He wasn't happy with Saul. And David was an individual, as we've seen, was a man after God's own heart. He, he wanted to make God happy. Even though he wasn't perfect, that he, he had that desire. But you also know verse 4 again, right? Many people are fled from the battle. Many of the people also are fallen and dead. We know, we flip back to chapter 31, verse 7 again. Reading about the men that fled. Verses, uh, verses 6 and 7 of chapter 31, right? Many people have died, many people have fled. That's a very bad thing. We know that there are a lot of people in Israel that have lost their land as well. Uh, as, as is sort of hinted at by the idea of fleeing from battle. People have died, people have lost their land. This is very bad news. But here's the end of it, though. Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. You know, when you think back to what David said in 2 Samuel 4, verse 10, when he said that the messenger brought good tidings, 
In my mind, I have a picture here of a situation in which the messenger is basically telling the bad news up front and then saving the good news for the last. Because even though these bad things have happened, even though his appearance is bad, what, what David says about this messenger is that he, had, he came to David with good tidings. And for this messenger, apparently, in his mind, even though these Israelites have died, even though God's not happy, the most important thing for David here is that Saul and Jonathan are dead. Now, we can understand why Saul being dead, why, why Saul's death could be something that David wanted, right? Saul's the man who chased after him. Saul's the man who stood in his way of the throne. But when you're thinking about this, why would he also mention that Jonathan and his son are dead also, right? Because we know that Jonathan and David are very close friends. You have to keep in mind how a monarchy or how a kingdom worked, right? Generally, when a king died, his son took over. And perhaps what he's thinking here is that, you know, David, not only is Saul dead, but so also is the next heir to the throne. The next guy in line, he's also dead as well, David. And so now I come, and, and so now it helps explain the end of verse 2. This man falls and, and, and is... Uh, worshiping David, so to speak, because he knows that David is going to be the next king of Israel. Because he reemphasizes re that Saul and Jonathan are dead. Now, verse 5, David wants a little bit of reassurance, right? David said unto the young man that told him, How do you know that Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead? You know, when you think about this, perhaps David's a little bit surprised by this. Uh, you know, when you hear somebody that's close to you has passed away, sometimes it takes you a, a minute to register. It takes a minute for, for that to register. If you think about the situation David's in, obviously he hasn't seen what's happened. You know, and sometimes it's easy when a, a, a very tragic thing happens where a lot of people have died. It's one thing to say that many people have died, but it's another thing to point out two specific individuals that, that have died. So... You know, think about 9-11, for, for instance, right? Whenever you saw those towers collapsed, uh, you knew that a lot of people died, right? When those towers collapsed, people were in it. You knew that a lot of people died. But to be able to go and say that two specific people died in 9-11, when those buildings collapsed, it meant that either you communicated with them and they told you they were there, or perhaps you saw their body that had died. And, and perhaps what David wants here is, again, a little bit more specifics. You know, it's one thing to say that a lot of people have died in battle, but to know that Saul and Jonathan have died would have possibly meant that this soldier had saw them die or that's, that he had come across their bodies dead on the battlefield. And we'll see that David knows that how this messenger responds will determine how David acts in the matter. So verses 6 through 10, the messenger gives a story. Now we note here that this story is different than what happens at the end of chapter 31. Verse 6, the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me. And I answered, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who are you? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish has come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head, and the bracelet that was, upon, or that was on his arm, and have brought them here to my Lord." So let's back up to verse 6. Now note how he starts this off, right? Note how he starts his story off. As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa. Basically what he's saying there is, you know, I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Is the idea that he presents here. I, I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. You think about with it, when it, in the Bible... This, this phrase often is connected to the providence of God, right? It's more than just 
these things have happened by chance, but it almost carries the idea that this servant is getting at that perhaps God is God had been behind this. Is I happened by chance that the circumstances have, have worked in my favor. Or the circumstances worked to where, as he says in verse 10, I had the opportunity to take his life. Now you think about what he says there, and you think about how that compares with David, and how on multiple occasions David not by chance, but because of the providence of God and just the situation in which he was, where David had the opportunity to take Saul's life. But he didn't do that because Saul was God's, the Lord's anointed, the anointed king of Israel. And he never took, he never took Saul's life. But this messenger again, it just so happened that I was there. Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. Now, I was reading what one commentator was saying, but it does make sense. This could have been one hole in this messenger's story. Obviously, we know what happened in 1 Samuel 31, which is also stated in 1 Chronicles 10, that this is how Saul died. But this story that he presents here is a little bit different. But one commentator pointed this out about one of the specific things he says here in verse 6. He said that the chariots and the horsemen followed hard after him on Mount Gilboa, right? Verse 6. Now, one of the things about how chariots and how they were used in military battle is that they were most effective, they were most often used on flat land because it's easier for a horse to run on flat land than it is for a horse to run down a hill generally. They, they, can, you know, they can move a lot faster. That's... Uh, I think I've heard that when somebody is talking about uh, bears uh, trying to get away from a bear. A bear cannot run as fast down a hill because it, there's a high probability that it can trip and, and roll over, right? Just like we can trip running down a hill. So we're told that chariots were not often used in, uh, on, on, on places that were not level. And we know that Saul dies on Mount Gilboa. So some have pointed out here that you know, he makes a mistake here because generally chariots would not be used to try to pursue somebody in the mountains. They wouldn't be uh, uh, useful. They're, they're generally just useful on flat land. Whatever the case may be, this is a part of this story. When he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me, and I answered, Here am I. Again, he, he wants to know who he is, and I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And so, verse 9, Saul says basically, right, Verse 9 and 10, uh, Saul knew, knew he was about to die, and so he asked the Amalekite to take his life. And that's what happens. Verse 10, So I stood upon him and slew him because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and have brought them here unto my Lord. Now, a couple of things in verse 10, and this will be where we stop. You know that he takes the crown from Saul, he takes the bracelet from Saul. Now this would have, of course, shown to us that he did find the body of Saul and Jonathan. Now when he takes the crown, he takes the bracelet of the king and gives it to David. That is, for sure we know that this messenger recognizes that David is the next king of Israel. But the reason why he gives this story to David is actually to try to gain David's favor. In, in the mind of the Amalekite here... If he comes to David and he tells David, I'm the one responsible for taking Saul's life. I'm the one who has killed. I am the one who has killed your adversary. And I have now brought you the crown. I have brought you the king's bracelet to give to you because I recognize you to be the next king. This messenger is thinking that David is going to reward him. That David is going to reward him. He, he killed David's adversary. He's got the... The, the, royal, uh, uh, the, the, the royal items that, that denoted a king. And in his mind, he's done all of this to try to prove to David his loyalty, that he's going to uh, be loyal to him as king. He thinks this is a very good thing. But David, on the other hand, recognized that it wasn't a good thing. And that's the res th this is it's so important about David, and this is where we're going to pick up next week about how David responds to this. This is not a positive thing that has happened. This is not a positive thing that has happened. We'll, uh, we'll pick up with that next week, but...
when we think about this section as we draw to a close, it, it does bring out something that we mentioned last week, but it goes back to this idea about how do we handle the, uh, how do we handle the failures of those that we don't like? A lot of times in life, we're happy to see them fail. We may aid to help them fail. You know, and we think about all those, those, those different ways. You, you know, you think about, I think about this in a workplace, right? Say that you're trying to get a promotion at the workplace. And the guy that has the position that you want, you see him struggling with his work. And perhaps you know that you can help him out or you know how to do it a better way to make it easier. But you decide to sit back and you allow that man to fail so that way you can gain his position. You think that's the right thing to do in that situation? It's not the golden rule, right? The golden rule is whatever uh, you should want, uh, whatsoever men that uh, should do unto you, do you also unto them, right? Whatever you want to be treated, you want to treat others the way that you want to be treated. And David certainly recognized that about Saul. David was not a man who was waiting there for Saul to fail so that way he could glory in Saul's failure. That's what, the, that's what the messenger is thinking in verse 10, but David gives him a very much different picture of what he's thinking beginning in verse 11, which is where we'll pick up next week. Are there any comments or anything that you'd like to add on to what we've talked about this morning? Yeah, exactly. And we'll see how that plays out with David next week about handling, handling this messenger. We'll stop here. Thank you again for your time and attention. We'll pick up in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11 next uh, Lord's Day.